Hello, everybody. Um, as Carl said, I wasn't planning on doing this, so I've thrown this together um, as a favor. So hopefully you guys can gain something out of it. As I said, it's pretty uh, fundamental, should I say. Um, I don't know how open we are to discussion. I don't know how many designers and naval architects are out there in the high-speed realm, hopefully some. I know there's one over there. But um, I'd like, if, if I need to elaborate on anything, please just raise your hand and maybe we can have a little bit of a discussion like that if I have time, okay? So, um, the, uh, first off, uh, my name's Andrew Lee. Uh, I'm a naval architect for Prime Invest Shipbuilding um, with about 25 years of uh, very high-speed vessel design, okay, and operation and building, okay? So, uh, I thought maybe we'd have a little look into some optimization techniques that we're using for some of our high-speed vessels at this time. I can't go into too much detail for uh, uh, intellectual property reasons, et cetera. But there's some stuff in there that maybe you guys haven't thought about before that might be of interest. And you know, you guys can take it back home and say, oh, you know, I heard uh, something cool that this guy said maybe we should do at the bottom of the hull, and let's, let's try it out. Yeah? It's all about experimentation and getting, getting data, obviously. So we'll start off. Just a quick introduction, um, uh, what we're actually going to talk about. Um, then I'll go into the basic hull design parameters, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but we'll just go through that, uh, the sort of classic design spiral. Um, again, focusing on, on vessels mainly over 60 knots, uh, stepped hull, okay? Um, then we're gonna break the boat down into the three constituent parts, uh, for, forward part, mid part, and aft part, basically, um, and kind of talk a little bit about uh, compromise, because we always talk about compromise, but we'll get into a little bit of that uh, later on and maybe how to balance that compromise out a bit so you can get the best of both worlds. Um, and then we'll look at how we can get the best of both worlds by compromising, or sorry, reducing compromise um, and using some tools um, to try and focus in on, on uh, making those sections of the hull as efficient as humanly possible based on what the end use of the vessel needs to be. Um, if we have time, we'll look at some uh, advanced concepts um, different sorts of hulls out there, stuff that I was involved with in the past that may be becoming a bit more relevant now. Um, uh, additional reductions, that's mainly for, for, for shock mitigation again before you get to the seat if we have time. And then again, discussion. Uh, Any time, raise your hand if, if we want to have a chat about something, okay? So, uh, as I said, it's a, a high-level concept for further discussion, meaning I put this together real quick, so if there's something there that you want to elaborate more on, if it can't, can't happen here because we're all out of time, we'll do it later. I'm the tall guy. I'll be down at the boats, et cetera, et cetera. Please feel free to come and have a chat. Um, so I call it a modest preliminary analysis logic for new hull designs relative to key factors, okay? So basically, you've got a clean sheet of paper, and it's time to design a boat. Uh, you've got a potential client. Uh, you're going to go through the basic parameters of what the hull needs to do, where it's going to operate, et cetera. We'll look at that. Um, and then we'll look at the different characteristics to be examined based on key performance criteria for vessels over 60 knots, okay? Um, uh, providing, uh, proving concepts with high-level CFD and FEA, okay? So we're doing a lot of stuff with CFD right now, very powerful CFD that we're using for both aero and hydro for high speed. Um, uh, we're using about 12,000 cores right now um, in the UK to run very high-end optimization um, CFD runs. So a little bit about that. Um, uh, model tests uh, that we all know about. Uh, workable scale prototypes is a big deal for me. That's what I love to do if I've got enough budget um, and enough time before I go to full scale. We'll do a small scale build uh, and prove that, get a lot of good data from that before we go into the full scale build. Um, and then advanced concepts, if we have time, talking about some pretty radical stuff out there that's happening, okay? So, uh, preliminary design study. Obviously, uh, the important parameters, area of operation, where's the boat gonna be operating, okay? If it's gonna be on a lake, fantastic, okay? Then you probably don't need to worry too much about compromise because if you want a high-speed boat that's gonna operate all the time in flat water, you just really need to focus on the back end of the boat, obviously. I'm talking more about hull design here, guys. Uh, obviously, weight's a, more, a very important factor. The powering, uh, to the, uh, the powering and the speeds, uh, design spirals, it says here is very important, but I, I haven't got time to go into that. So we're purely looking at, at the hull, the outer hull right now, okay? Um, 
if it's not flat water, then uh, you know the, the maximum uh, significant wave height or the, or the actual maximum height and the probability of encounter for those wave fronts is something that obviously has to be thought about from a very early, early stage, okay, based on the, the area of operation of the vessel. Uh, also, a very important factor for, for some of the smaller boats that you guys are involved in is, uh, is the wavelength. Again, where's the boat going to be operating? Is it a short, choppy sea, real steep, shallow water, or is it nice rolling swells out there in the Atlantic or the Pacific? It, it all has to be factored in. Maybe you need to make the boat a little bit longer because the predominant sea, uh, sea state uh, has, a, has a wavelength which, which kind of matches the, the, the size of the boat the client wants. So maybe you need to maybe adjust the hull length a little bit slightly, but keep it, you know, keep the overall length as what the client wants. You understand? So there's some optimizations that need to be looked at there, obviously. Windage is another big one, I guess, uh, if you're in a very windy area as far as, you know, uh, top sides and, and what you've got <laughs> on the top of the boat as far as the superstructure or whatever, as far as windage goes. Um, speed powering, design spiral, we all know about that. So that's obviously something we look at at an early stage. Uh, range with fuel, obviously we all look at that as well. How much fuel do we need on board based on our selection for powering to match the speed, but obviously the weight of the boat's very important too there, and the hull design, so it all goes together as we know. Uh, payload variation is a big one too. Eh? So as naval architects, we're, we're, we're sometimes a little bit blinded by saying, oh, it's a 70 knot boat or blah, blah, blah. But is it really, you know, I mean, yes, you, you do 70 knots on a great day, um, but you're trying to sell the boat. For, well, for my, predominantly, I'm, I'm military, so there's a lot of payload that these guys put on this boat, you know? They're gonna put a couple of 50 cows in there. What's gonna, what do they put on? I got guys who, you know, want Hellfire missiles on boats, for goodness sake. So there's a lot of payload variation that can happen on a boat. So you really need to, to look at the, what, what's the maximum these guys are gonna put on this platform and still you can say with your hand on your heart, it's a 70 knot boat, right? So things to think about from an early stage. Uh, the usage obviously is a big one where, you know, who, who's gonna use the boat? Is it a military boat? Who's operating it? Uh, as well as where the operating actually is, is very important. Um, so coming back to what the client wants based on, you know, what the functionality, what, what the usage of the boat's going to be, um, what's the client's preliminary request? Is it, I want the fastest boat uh, possible? Or is it, I want the best maneuverability? Or is it, I want the best sea keeping? Or more than, uh, most commonly, it's, I want all three, right? So that's when our compromise comes in. You can't have all three. It's not a perfect world. So something's got to suffer, right? So uh, as engineers and architects, we've got to come up with a, uh, an analysis, I guess, based on historical data and based on some smart tools that we can use to reduce the level of compromise that we have to, that we have to put into the hull. So the client still gets what we call a, a, a low compromise hull, okay? So just uh, to kind of illustrate what I said, um, we can split, you know, oops, sorry. We can split this hull here, it's a twin step, so that's a 20 meter hull, it's called the V3. It's quite a special boat. Uh, I won't go into how fast it is, but it, it's pretty fast. Um, so essentially I've just taken it. We can call this aft section hull section one, hull S1, and then hull S2 and hull S3, okay? And we can call it names. So uh, the forward section, okay, the part of the boat that's worried about wave fronts approaching, following seas, stuffing, et cetera, and being able to plow through waves, et cetera. This is the forward section that we all, we all love, okay? So there it is, flare, et cetera, a bunch of stuff that we can talk about there. Midsection, um, mid to LCG basically is hull section two, all right? It's where the center of gravity of the boat is, normally where you'd be driving the boat, normally where the cockpit is, so to speak. Um, it's gonna take the predominant forces from wave slamming events. So that's where we want to look at these and what we're going to be doing with that to try and minimize the, the shock on the, on the vessel and on, on the crew, okay? And then aft uh, so is uh, hull section one, which is uh, predominantly your, your speed surface, okay? Again, we're talking high speed here. So where we want the boat to be planing is predominantly on this aft planing surface at very, very high speeds, okay? If the steps are doing their jobs, et cetera. So the main uh, pressure distribution area would be, would be around about here, okay? So the, the dynamics of what's going on there at high speeds is, is very, very important. 
Um, but again, if, if uh, we're not going to be operating the boat all the time on flat water, then we have to compromise that somewhat to be able to have a, a, a low level of compromise throughout the boat. So I just put this quick graph together to kind of illustrate what I just said. Um, there's the different three hull sections. Hull one is affected by speed, hull two, shock reduction, and hull three, wavefront dissipation. I came up with that. Okay. Now, I if we're after, the client's after a higher speed, uh, number one is no compromise. That's it. He, he said, high speed, that's all I care about. Okay. So that's a compromise factor of one. All right. Uh, but what does that do? Once, you, once you've used uh, uh, zero compromise here, you have to take it away from somewhere else. So you've gone negative uh, 0.5 as far as a compromise factor, which is just something I just made up, but it makes some sort of sense uh, for shock reduction because you've put, all the, you've put no compromise for the speed. Uh, the same for wavefront dissipation, you've gone point, uh, negative 0.5. So you just total that up and you get zero, okay? So your compromise factor total, because I'm relying 100% on high speed, is, is zero, okay? So that, that boat, you, it's not going to work too well in, in choppy waves or even big seas. It's just not going to do a very good job. But on flat water, hey, it's going to kick ass, right? But <laughs> so we go to the next one, um, uh, high shock mit mitigation. The, the, the client wants a boat that's super smooth riding. He can take it out and beat the crap out of it, and everyone's going to be OK on board. The boat's going to survive, no stress, et cetera, et cetera. So that's got a compromise factor of, of, of one there, just as we did with speed, but it brings these two guys down. Um, speed's going to be reduced significantly because of this. Uh, wavefront dissipation is not going to be reduced so much because obviously you're looking at a, a deeper V hull, so that's not going down too much. So we add that up and we get one. So as a total compromise factor, that's, that's not bad. It's obviously better than this, okay? We're looking at shock uh, mitigation. Uh, we increase the, the wavefront dissipation, uh, but we reduce the top end speed, so we've got a, a, a factor of one. Do the same thing for the highest uh, wavefront dis dispersion. Speed again is the same. Uh, shock reduction basically switches here, okay, and we get one again, okay. Uh, but then if we get most o o best overall, a best all around, we just go 0.5 across the board, and lo and behold, we get a, a better compromise factor of 1.5. So it's just the logic in it, okay? We're trying to balance that compromise out between all three um, performance, uh, what should I call, uh, performance requirements based on the different hull sections. Uh, so hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Um, now, looking at those three sections and how we can actually um, improve uh, the compromise by, by localizing the study of each section and saying, okay, here we have outer, mi outer limits, sorry, it's the next slide. We've got an outer limits boat here. I think that's currently the world record holder monohull speed record, all right? Great boat, but it's doing what it needs to do. I mean, that's a, that's a, 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 a one compromise high speed boat. That's what it's designed to do. Break records on flat water and, and, and that's it. As you can see, it's doing exactly that. It's utilizing that aft section 100% to plane, okay? Reduces wetted surface area. The steps are doing a great job. Huge amounts of power and, you know, 200 plus mile an hour boat. So um, just some things that we could do, because obviously uh, the boats that we're talking about, uh, this isn't really valid, but um, uh, based on the, the, the higher speed requirement, um, without adding too much compromise to that, uh, that high-speed planing surface aft, um, we can look at step geometry and angle of attack of planing surfaces, which is very, very important for stepped hull. So after that last step, uh, as well as all the geometry that goes into the step ventilation, is, is what is the angle of attack of that last step, okay? Um, too much, and yeah, we get lots of lift, but it's going to bring the back of the boat up too much, and we also increase the drag. So it's very important to analyze that, okay? It's a very key factor, it, it speeds over 60 knots. Um, dead rise reduction limits, okay? So how, how, how low can we go with the dead rise? Right? We don't want to go too low because as the graph showed or as the table showed before, it's going to compromise other stuff. So we're trying to get a middle of the road compromise. So studies into the, the minimum reduction that you want to go to the dead rise. It's like, there's no way I'm going to go more than 19 degrees and that, that's set in stone. Now, why would you say that? You need to have some empirical data or some CFD studies that say, <laughs> I'm running out of time, anyway. Um, on and on I go. Some other stuff that's, that's fairly interesting is uh, spray rail placement geometry, keel flats. Uh, everyone's 
knows about keel flax, etc. So I'm going to share with you. Um, we've been doing a lot of stuff with, uh, you know, first of class boats and the prototypes that I mentioned, whereby we, we put inserts and molds um, that we can actually take out and bolt on different sort of keel geometries at the back of the boat. Okay, which is kind of a cool thing that more people should be doing, I think, because at high speeds it makes a hell of a difference. Um, all the stuff pretty much that I'm talking about here, uh, this is the middle section of the vessel uh, where we're trying to reduce loading as far as slamming. Uh, the off-heart boat is, is outside. That's got a variable dead rise using longitudinal steps and what we call a forefoot, which is working really well. I, I advise you go out there and try that boat. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very smooth riding boat. Um, but it's also, it's got a pretty good top end and uh, it's fairly good with, uh, with oncoming waves, et cetera. Um, wave piercing, that's a pure wave piercer right there. That's one of our wave piercers. Uh, that's a prototype 72 knot boat. So um, we talk about wave piercers till the cows come home, but that's a real wave piercer. But uh, again, how, what, what, what's the extent do you want to take the bow function, the bow design into the boat? Is it, is it just a conventional to a reverse to a pure wave piercer? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be looked at there. Again, looking at uh, different ballast systems is a big one too. We utilize ballast systems on, on a lot of our high-speed boats too to, to be able to reduce that compromise. You know, With ballast, you can, you can really get the bow down and make it more efficient through waves and get rid of the ballast when the, when the water's calm and gun it and you're riding on the back. You know, So good stuff. Uh, here's some of the boats um, where I'd say have a low compromise design. They've been designed similar to the kind of functionality that I'm talking about. Uh, some are ours. That's the new American Mark I CCM. Um, so uh, again, not so much ribby stuff, but uh, all high-speed boats, 60 knot plus, you know? Um, what I'd call low compromise here on the right and high compromise on the left. I don't know if anyone here is from Victoria or Yonkonic, but um, I know both boats and um, they could be improved, like, like every boat can be improved. Um, but anyway, some examples there. Um, CFD, some examples of the CFD that we're running to do localized studies, yeah? Um, am, I, am I out of time now, mate? Uh, for example, um, vital that we understand the free flow profile behind the boat here so we can maximize the loading on the propeller for propeller design. So there's an Arneson drive. We're running at 75 knots here with a twin step hull, looking at all the different sections and understanding the flow separation from the transom and the aeration from the steps that you can see here and how it interacts with the prop, okay? So localized CFD studies before finalizing the design is, it's tools that are readily available and I encourage everybody to use them, really. Um, if you're more interested in it, come and ask me after the presentation and we'll talk more about it. Um, but it's really, really helped us to really not just do powering like the guys who do the propellers, et cetera, give them your hull design, they come back with, oh yeah, this is your curve, blah, blah, blah. But actually look at the details of the hull and say, well, if I want to use this keel flat, what's that going to do? Let's do a CFD at 75 knots of how that step's aerated, et cetera, et cetera. They're, it's all doable very easily. Um, so there's some other crazy stuff that I was going to talk about, but uh, no time right now. And, and that's about it, guys. So sorry to go on a little bit, but... Uh, it's a lot to cover, and I wasn't expecting to do this presentation. So thank you very much.